covers the highest return for foreign direct investment in the world, according to the United Nations. And uh, many investors see Africa as the final frontiers as other more emerging markets such as China and India continue to mature. So um, with a young population of about 1 billion and significant natural resources, Africa is growing in popularity among investors from around the world over the past few decades. However, there are still certain risks involved in investing in Africa, such as political instability or public health risks. So let's talk about it today. Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you from Changsha, central China's Hunan province. I'm honored to be joined here by four heads of uh, investment promotion agencies from four African countries who are participating in this year's expo. So ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, let's meet them. They are Abebe Abebayehu, Commissioner of the Ethiopian Investment Commission. <laughs> Dr. Moses Ikiara, Managing Director of the Kenya Investment Authority. Mr. Lorenzo Sambal, Director General of the Mozambique Agency for Investment and Export Promotion. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Albert Hamwampa, Acting Export Director of the Zambia Development Agency. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome to the show. So let's start the discussion and I would like to start by giving you the floor to talk, to talk uh, to us about uh, what kind of advantages your country can offer to foreign investors, especially investors from China, and what are, let's say, three main factors, uh, sectors you would like to in, uh, attract Chinese investors. Tell us a bit about the advantages in your country. Ethiopia uh, is located at the Horn of Africa. It's the second uh, largest populous nation in Africa. Some people call it landlocked. We prefer to call it rail-linked with the port of Djibouti. Uh, we have uh, uh, massive investment on infrastructure, uh, one of which is actually a railway connecting uh, the different economic corridors to the port of Djibouti. So while uh, we do not have you know, immediate access to the sea, uh, that has not been a problem for Ethiopia. So there are actually a considerable number of reasons why uh, companies should consider investing in Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia has, 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 has attracted a significant amount of investment over the last uh, six, seven years. It has actually been the second largest recipient of foreign direct investment in year uh, 2017. Uh, and China is our largest source of uh, foreign direct investment, largely because of the vast uh, investment opportunities that the country avails but most importantly also because of the strategic political relationship that Ethiopia has uh, with uh, the government of China. We provide uh, abundant and competitive labor force. Uh, we uh, provide access uh, to markets, uh, to the likes of the European Union as part of the Everything But Arms Initiative, but also to the United States of America. Anything that's manufactured in Ethiopia can actually be exported to the United States of America duty-free, uh, quota-free. We provide, again, competitive and uh, abundant renewable resources. Uh, these are you know, the, the, the reasons that many companies prefer to come and invest in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. What are three sectors you could name at this moment that you would like to attract most investment from abroad, especially from China? Given that Ethiopia is the second most populous nation in Africa, labor-intensive industries are highly encouraged to come and invest in Ethiopia. So uh, textile and apparel, uh, leather and leather products manufacturing, agro-processing uh, are you know, the three most important sectors that you should look into uh, while considering investment in Ethiopia. All right. Um, Kenya is located right next to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is landlocked, but it, it, it believes it is not disadvantaged. So what can Kenya offer that is different from Ethiopia for foreign investors? We have um, Vision 2030, which is our plan for where we want to go by the year 2030. We want to make sure, like China has done, no Kenyans below the poverty line by the year 2030. Up to 2022, our president has identified four priorities. It, we call it the big four, or the president calls it the big four. 
One is agriculture, food security and nutrition. So from growing food, uh, storing it, processing, making sure it's not uh, wasted because we lose sometimes 40%. The second area is manufacturing. Under manufacturing, like Ethiopia, is, uh, for, we are focusing on labor-intensive uh, areas, textiles, the entire uh, cotton, uh, textile, apparel, value chain, then leather processing. We happen to be next to Ethiopia in terms of the, the population of uh, livestock in Africa. Other areas like electronics assembly and all that are part of manufacturing. The third area is affordable housing. We need to build about at least half a million housing units by the year 2022. And finally, universal health care, which is one of the global agendas at the moment, uh, if you look at uh, you know, sustainable dialogue, um, development dialogue. Okay, so indeed a very diverse uh, picture of opportunities there. So let's move down south to Mozambique. Um, Mozambique is located on the east coast of uh, South Central Africa, if I'm correct. It has a very long coastline as well. And Mozambique is uh, one of the only countries that I've uh, stayed a bit in Africa, so I have a very special relation, feeling towards that country. So Mr. Sambal, tell us a bit about uh, the advantages your country boasts for foreign investors. The government of Mozambique have decided to name four areas. Number one is agriculture and agro-processing. Of course we can cry because we are still poor, but we cannot cry because we are not eating. It doesn't make sense. But number two, of course, there is no way we can deal with agriculture and agro-processing without infrastructure. We need to build roads, telecommunication, you know, everything must be in place. And China is playing a very good role in that area as well. Of course, there is no way we can deal with agriculture, we can develop infrastructure without power. But number four, of course, there is no way we can develop our economy, we can have good employment without another very important sector, which is tourism. Mozambique is very well blessed and we compared with Kenya, I mean, I mean with Ethiopia. Kenya is, is, is like us, of course. Because we have in a way, you know, the, the, the coastline, as you said, long coastline, where you can enjoy the wildlife tourism, you end up swimming, which is very good. So tourism is very important for Mozambique. So this is the potential we have. Agriculture, infrastructure, Energy, Energy, tourism. Tourism. Very interesting. Uh, different as well. Different from the previous two countries. Now let's hear uh, our representative from Zambia, Mr. Hawampa. Uh, Zambia is right l uh, west to Mozambique. Again, landlocked. But do you see that as an advantage as well? Zambia, in terms of political stability, is second to none in the world. So we have very good political stability in Zambia. Investors can come and they can have confidence that their investments will be very safe for many years to come. Secondly, I think Zambia does offer a wide range of investment opportunities and also incentives. We offer accelerated depreciation on manufacturing, on energy, and we also ensure that when we import machinery and equipment, that you are going to use into your investment, it's zero rated in terms of customs duty. Thirdly, the market. Zambia is placed in the middle of southern Africa, surrounded by eight neighbors. And that's a huge market. We are in Comesa, we are in Sadak, we are now in the tripartite where the GDP is around 1.3 million US dollars with a population of 650 million. Now Zambia is already signed the African continental free trade area with an excess of billion population, that's a huge market, also in trillions of dollars of uh, GDP. The first priority for Zambia is agriculture. Almost 70% of Zambians are engaged in agriculture. Secondly, is manufacturing. We want our investors to come and invest in agriculture, but also move further into agro-processing, which is part of manufacturing. We believe that that is also one of the priority sectors that Zambia is embarking on. Thirdly, infrastructure is very, very important to Zambia. We believe these are the three sectors. But if you allowed me to add the fourth one, I would also add energy. So I think Zambia okay. also you know, puts the fourth one to make sure that we supply energy to the manufacturing sector and other sectors.
Thank you. I see uh, Mr. Halampa. It's interesting that all four of you mentioned agriculture and agri-processing. So I'm going to ask one more question on that, on that front. Chinese investors in Africa have traditionally been concentrated in construction, uh, I understand, or larger infrastructure products in terms of agriculture or agro-processing. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge and what, how do you want to tackle that challenge, meaning preferential policies or special uh, incentives to attract more Chinese investors to the sector? Mr. Sambal. In terms of agriculture, in our case in Mozambique, the challenge is to bring the value chain. The value chain is very important. There is no way you can develop agriculture, you know, taking aside the value chain. When I talk about value chain, it, it comes from, first of all, incentive to be provided to agriculture, number one. But number two, we, we need a logistic in place, which means we have to have transportation in place, routes, the infrastructure for agriculture must be irrigation. It's very, very important. We cannot just rely, rely you know, on rain. In our case, irrigation is very, very important. The challenge we have, we need experts. The human capital in agro-pressing. Agriculture is a science. It cannot just be done, you know, by 98% in our case. We need to shift from, you know, household agriculture to commercial farming. Okay, Dr. Ikeara? Now, what we need to do there, there are several things. Number one is that um, productivity of our agriculture is very low. So the first, the first step is to increase productivity. After that, you then focus on, um, uh, because we lose, in Kenya for sure, we lose about 40% of what we produce through uh, poor post-harvest uh, management. So you can imagine a poor country struggling, then you lose 40% of your, of your production. It is really a, a big a bro. So we need uh, to, to do uh, better storage, improve uh, distribution so that if you have a surplus, a surplus part of the country, it's able to take its uh, surplus production to other parts of the country. Yeah. And uh, for this, we need cold storage infrastructure. During this expo, have there been any interests expressed from Chinese participants to invest in these sectors that you mentioned, Dr. Ikiara? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, even though most of the Chinese investment has been in uh, infrastructure, we are very, very excited by the fact that now the, a company can come which is starting to build roads. And uh, in Kenya, we have an example of China Ui Limited, which came and built, uh, built the first uh, superhighway uh, in our country and became very, very popular. But it has since gone to the manufacture of construction materials. They want to start even exporting avocado and other produce from Kenya to China. So they are evolving. I see. Uh, Dr. Abe Bayahu, you have been participating in this expo and you also expressed the need for more investment in the agricultural sector. What has been the feedback you have gotten from talking to people and uh, what are some of the concerns maybe people have expressed about investment in this sector and how do you think you can address that? I mean, Ethiopia uh, has uh, significant Arab land and uh, agriculture remains to be the mainstay of the economy, but we have not done a considerable work in terms of uh, growing the agro-processing sector. But of late, we have given due attention to the agro-processing sector. So we're already looking at uh, a significant interest from Chinese companies uh, who have seen uh, the great potential that Ethiopia provides in this, in this sector. So I understand that uh, over the past decade, especially Chinese investors have been particularly active in Africa and uh, that growth rate is expected to go even further. So I would like to give this opportunity for you to share with our participants here, with our uh, audiences here, what you have observed as some of the characteristics of Chinese investors vis-a-vis -vis their international counterparts and what can help them to do better in the future. Mr. Uh, Hawampa, maybe let me start with you. You know, Zambia is a, is a very unique country and if you come into Zambia right now, you'll find that uh, the Chinese culture and the Zambian culture, they are first integrating 
you will find that in Zambia already there are universities that have taken up Chinese language as one of the courses to make sure that there's this synergy between the Chinese culture and the Zambian culture. I think you, you agree with me that the most important thing that is required between the Chinese investor and the Zambian people in other part of Africa is to be able to co communicate and understand each other's culture. So I think the Zambian government has taken a major step in the education sector to make sure that they allow those who want to invest in the education sector to make sure that there is a common understanding between our two cultures and the Chinese culture. And you find that also the Chinese people are in some of the priority sectors like uh, infrastructure, the road networks and so on and so forth, and also in the agro-processing that you, you posed earlier on. There are a lot of opportunities in, in terms of building up storage facilities, in terms of um, going into the farming blocks, in terms of multi-facility economic zones as a model that has, uh, Zambia has adopted. Already, there are two functioning multi-facility economic zones that are run by the Chinese, you know, and in those multi-facility economic zones, the Zambian government has put up incentives to make sure that people can pull into those zones, that they can set up. The Zambian government has made sure that there is no customs due to on equipment, on machinery, the, the accelerated depreciation is applying to those investors. We also have government related mount facility economic zones and also the government is setting up farming blocks where we're encouraging investors from China and elsewhere to go in those farming blocks. Government has provided infrastructure like roads, electricity to make sure that the agriculture along the value chains is some of the cornerstones of our economy and also FDIs. Yeah. So the Chinese are everywhere. <laughs> the Chinese need to understand the local culture a bit better. Yes. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Okay, Mr. Zambo, what's the case with Mozambique? Well, uh, I totally agree with the uh, Zambian brother here. Uh, what you have said, it happened also in Mozambique, because Zambian and Mozambique, you never know who is from Zambia, who is from Mozambique, <laughs> <laughs> one neighbor. But l l let me just highlight in the way you know the launching today of this platform, information, market information is very important. Chinese investors, they need to be helped by delivering not just land, but also the market information. Another issue which is very important in our case, we need to build up agri-poles. I'm talking about poles for agriculture park. Industrial park. We have already, in our case, uh, an economic zone managed by Chinese a company in Beira, in Sofala, where we just had this heat of Edai. And this is an interport, because at the end of the day, we need to add value, as I, ju I just said, and Chinese experts are very important. They can play, and they're playing a very good role. We need to train people. Training is very important. Okay. Knowledge sharing, sharing from China. For the case of uh, Kenya. Right now we have more than 400 Chinese companies in Kenya. And they are growing every day. Chinese, unlike many other uh, investors from other countries, their decision making and they, is very fast. They have a very short, a quick turnaround time. Mm -hmm. So from the time they say, I'm interested in this. You'll be surprised, actually, just a couple of months down the road, they have already gone ahead of what you, you thought they would have done. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? No, it's a good thing. It's, we are impatient in Africa. We want to, to cure uh, poverty. So we like that pace. A yeah. uh, second time is that they have a unique work ethic. Very hard working. Uh, in our country, we used to see roads taking forever to get finished. Chinese roads are finished ahead of time, even a little way. So this is something very refreshing and something we have uh, come to appreciate a lot in, in Kenya. Number three is uh, the ability to diversify. So they start off as an EPC contractor and then they are going into investment. This is really uh, fantastic because we are not seeing it in many other, in many other countries. Any yes, honest yes. advice? Yes, yes. The last observation is about large scale. They want to do things on a bigger scale not a small project, again, which is an advantage because 
we have a record of having an impact quickly. Now, areas they can do better is uh, to, to, to form more partnerships. Because when you partner, it's a very strong partnership because you have people who know the local terrain, they have all the connections, and you have the Chinese who bring other factors, and you get a win-win uh, for, for everybody. So this is something we like to encourage. Also, we like to see more focus on pro processing for export. Because one of the key things uh, China presents is a big market. And if we can have some companies that are processing with the identify a gap in the Chinese market, a process to supply there, again, this will be a, a game changer. It will be something very, very impactful for our country. I think one unique advantage that the Chinese investors bring uh, to Africa is uh, they have lived through the different challenges while China grew. Uh, uh, economically. So some of the challenges that they experience while investing in countries like Ethiopia, they understand it's a matter of time before those challenges are solved. So that gives you a perspective to clearly communicate uh, with them. Uh, whereas, you know, many other investors might feel frustrated easily for every challenge that they might be facing. So that's, I think, one unique attribute that the Chinese investors bring. All right. So we're going to look, turn to some negative um, perspectives, especially observed from outside, uh, this very political issue of uh, so-called debt burdens, or debt burdens per se, uh, that uh, potentially Chinese investors can bring to some African countries. And there are some, uh, a lot of uh, media reports, especially in international media, for instance, this one, which uh, was carried by this uh, press called uh, Foreign Policy, which says that in Africa, uh, Burundi, Chad, Mozambique, and Zambia are all either in debt distress or at high risk of it, a situation China's predatory lending practices are exacerbating. So, Mr. Hawampa, let me go to you first. How do you look at the issue of uh, debt distress because of your cooperation with China? Uh, is that a concern? There is no point or any country rather in the world that has not borrowed. But I think what is important is to make sure that your policies are in place to make sure that you service your debt. So our relationship as Zambia and China in terms of the debt issues, I think we are moving in the right direction. We have seen, like we have already discussed, that China is very strong in terms of productivity in areas of infrastructure development and also agro-processing. So we have teamed up to make sure that as a country we achieve these goals in a mutual kind of understanding, in an in a, in a, in a, in a angle of synergies, what China brings to the table and what, brings up, what Zambia brings to the table. So the debt issue always have cyclical issues anywhere in the world. So I think borrowing is in order, but to borrow to invest in high return investment areas, and then you always want to go to borrow where your money is cheap, where the interest rates are affordable. And I think every country has got that option, has got that choice. And Zambia has made a choice and we're moving in the right direction. What's the Mozambique um, criterion for selecting where you borrow and whether you borrow or you get more investment? The challenge today is to move into project finance. That's the way forward. Soft law, way forward. With China, of course, we do service our debt, which is very good, through as bank, through, you know, other sources here. We have some projects, for instance, a bank funded by Chinese bank, the China Development Bank, for instance, is one of them. So the macroeconomic stability is coming. We call, for instance, the year 2019, a year of change, economic transformation. So we need to be focused. So as my brother was saying in the way, there is no country without debt. Even China, you have debt. And what the we United need, States. Exactly. <laughs> what we need it. is how do you manage the trade-off. That's very important. And we can do. Soft loans is very, very important. We need to avoid, of course, in a way, you know, to have... Uh, our GDP lowering because of debt issue. We have to sense the macroeconomic stability, you know, the, 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 the economic 
trends first of all must be in place thank you very much dr ikiara debt is important it's everybody has to borrow to progress uh, having said that uh, for the kenya side we have our debt to gdp ratio is about 55 percent this is the highest so far and many people are talking so much about it but uh, imf which is the global authority on uh, debt sustainability issues has not said our debt is unsustainable so we still have actually headroom for kenya and for other countries what we need to to look out for are two factors number one as we get debt we make sure we negotiate the terms properly the other key to watch out is to make sure the resources are deployed in a productive manner so if you borrow and you invest in uh, infrastructure, in uh, technical training, in all these areas. Actually, the best way of dealing with the risk of uh, Dutch disease. So for countries like, uh, like Kenya, which have discovered oil and uh, minerals, will start enjoying the, the returns from these resources soon. The best way to ensure against the Dutch disease is to, to borrow, invest in infrastructure, make sure that your traditional exports are more competitive in the international markets and when the money comes from oil and minerals you don't buy a private jet for the president you use it to to pay debt which has been used properly and uh, finally from ethiopia what is your idea i would start by saying that you know the concern around debt is legitimate but uh, you know the commentaries that you quoted and uh, you know the campaign uh, in certain quarters of the world uh, is overblown uh, out of proportion, I would say, and more for political reasons than economic. Uh, that said, uh, we need to be conscious of uh, what we are borrowing, at what terms we are borrowing, and for what purpose we are borrowing. Uh, in Ethiopia, one of the areas where we are undergoing significant economic reform is in how we should be uh, uh, adjusting our uh, foreign uh, debts. Uh, so uh, much of our actually uh, loan has gone to building infrastructure, including the railway uh, that, uh, that's connecting the different economic corridors to the port of Djibouti, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, uh, developing renewable resources. So it's been a money well spent, but repaying this uh, loan would require adjusting uh, certain aspects of your economy, and that's why uh, we in Ethiopia were, were taking steps toward this uh, reforming our economy. Thank you so much. I think it is also uh, a, a consideration for China that uh, China, when China gives these loans, that it also needs to make sure that it can get the money back, right? So um, I think it is a, a, a mutually beneficial, it has to be a mutually beneficial practice and each side will have to make their decisions according to their own self-interest for the long term. I guess that's all the time we have for this very special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. Another round of applause to my four guests, Mr. Abe Bayahu from Ethiopia, Dr. Ikiara from Kenya, Mr. Sambo from Mozambique, and Mr. Hawampa from Zambia. And with that, we come to the end of this very special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Central China's Hunan province. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.